good morning. We want to welcome you this Sunday morning to Cross Creek Online. Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 21. You can download a copy of our notes off of our Facebook in PDF form. Also, I'd like to draw your attention to one of our announcements coming up on November 27th. We will be continue the Cross Creek Foundation and going to read to third graders in our Pontiac Public School classroom where we've been. If you'd like to donate towards that, a link on our Facebook page is available, and we appreciate any help you can give us. Would you join us in prayer as we get started today, as we continue our series, These Words That Jesus Spoke, and today we'll be in Matthew chapter 21. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you would connect us, Lord, even though we are no longer in person, but we are still believers in you, and you have saved us and changed our lives. Today, Lord, with all the craziness going on in the world and the chaos and the death and the destruction, Lord. We ask for just for the next 30 minutes, you would clear our mind, Lord, and help us to concentrate on you and your word. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Get your Bibles ready to Matthew chapter 21, and let's get started. This week I saw one of the most heartbreaking news stories. I was reminded again of the shooter who went into the Tennessee Christian school and did a horrible act. A biological girl who was encouraged in her delusion that she was a boy left behind a manifesto, a writing, and it was released to the public. Inside was the most vile and evil writings you could imagine. Racist comments. Comments of glee for the death of innocent children. Words of jealousy because others had things that they didn't. You see, I don't know what was in the hearts of the FBI agents and why they kept this writing from the public, but I do know what was in the heart of this young lady or woman. What was in her heart to murder innocent people was nothing more than pure evil. See, she, who does not deserve to have her name mentioned, was indoctrinated. She was taught this racism at a young age. Her mental derangement was not treated, but it was encouraged for something that I could only assume was for a political reason. A group, a group of people indoctrinated her because children are easily impressed. It is easy to impress new ideas and thoughts upon young children than it is upon older people. I thought of three things as I remembered that story, and I thought, Jesus demands we protect children. Jesus demands we protect children. We need to protect children from anything happening like this. If we can put security guards and anything like that in front of a, an airport to protect people on an airplane, then we should be able to do that in a school, whether public or Christian school. If we have money to send to countries around the globe, then we should have money to update security forces around the most vulnerable, our children. Jesus requires us to come in faith like a child. Kids are so important to Jesus and to God. And Jesus said that we come to know Christ as our personal Savior just like a child. It is only a child that Jesus said, if you hurt one of them, cause them to stumble, keep them from me. You should tie a rope around your neck and tie it to a rock and throw it into a river. Because kids are very important to Jesus. And we are God's children when we come to know Christ as their, our personal Savior. And I was also reminded that Jesus loves the worship of children. In Matthew chapter 21, where we'll be today, Jesus is coming into the temple to present himself as Messiah. We often call this event Palm Sunday. And too often the focus is always on the, the singing, the, the putting down of the palms and the coats and Jesus coming in. And we focus on that, but we miss something very important. In this event, Jesus is giving us some great lessons those lessons are about children, but those lessons are about to be active, to be active for Christ. If you're taking notes today, our one simple truth today is this. Jesus expects his followers to be active. He expects us to be active. I'm trying to be careful and not insult anyone, but we do have an obesity problem in America. And I'm not speaking of the extra weight that we all gain as we get older, that 20-some pounds, or even holiday weight. And... Nothing like that. I'm talking about the obesity that really ends life and limits us. It's weight from children to adults. And 
it all stems really from a sedentary culture. We don't have to get our own food anymore. It's very easy to achieve. We have cars and jobs that just let us sit and not move. You see, sitting can sometimes be just as bad for your health as smoking can be. And sitting in your faith can be deadly for your faith. We have become obese Christians. We have been spoon-fed God's word and we have had things that could possibly insult us or challenge us, removed from God's word, or we just don't talk about it. We have basically what looks like pep rallies instead of worship services. And we have become fat, lazy Christians in our culture. In Matthew chapter 21, this passage is a call to action. Join me in verse 10. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said this, underline this in verse 11. This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth. For three years, Jesus had been turning this area upside down. He had caused borderline riots to take place. There were mobs who wanted to take him, not kill him, but mobs who wanted to take him and make them their king. The religious people were afraid of him because they thought he would cost them their livelihood, and they began to plot to murder him. He has healed hundreds and probably thousands of people. He has taught things that no one else has ever heard before. And now he is coming into the city to present himself as Messiah. You see, in verse 10, we see all the commotion. But in verse 11, we see that the people still don't see who Jesus really is. Look what it says about him in the last part of verse 11. They said, Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. You see, if Jesus is just a prophet or a form of a man from Galilee, you have missed who he is. One of the worst verses of the Bible takes place in a few chapters in Matthew 25 and verse 41. It says, Then he shall say unto them on his left, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. See, that verses Jesus says that to are to religious people. It is to people who taught the Bible, taught the Word of God, taught about God. It is to people who supposedly cast out demons. And what Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. You see, it's not enough to believe about Jesus or even to believe he is a good man or believe he is a prophet. You see, he is either Lord or he is nothing. You see, in the future, Jesus will either be your Savior or he will be your judge. So what is salvation then? Well, I use this verse so often, but it's one of my favorite out of the Bible. Salvation is Romans 10, 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. In your notes, there's a phrase I want you to learn, and you can fill this in, but maybe write it in your Bible. At least write it on your heart and put it on your conscience if you haven't accepted Christ as your personal Savior. And that statement is this. Everyone in hell knows who Jesus, knows Jesus is God. Everyone in hell knows Jesus is and knows that he is God. But the problem is those that are in hell, it's too late to make a decision to accept Christ as their Savior. You see, today you can either pay for your own sin or you can accept what Christ did on the cross, what Jesus did in dying on that cruel Roman cross for you, and he can be your payment for your sin. Back to Matthew 21 and verse 12, Jesus repeats an event he did before. Jesus likes to just keep rolling out the classics. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Verse 13, And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. I'd like to point out three things if you're taking notes. I want you to remember this about Jesus cleansing the temple. First, Jesus does this twice. He does this at the beginning of his ministry, and he does it here near the end of his ministry. This must be very important. If Jesus is going to do it twice and cause such a great commotion and run these money changers and probably made a whip, the Bible tells us, and drive them out. By a little side note, no small little frail man could have done what Jesus is doing here. Jesus was a large, strong, masculine man, and only he could have probably done this. Only Jesus with a strong physical body could have endured what Satan did, probably trying to kill him before he got to the cross. Secondly, 
Jesus was not concerned about money in the church. I've heard this verse often misused and say, well, this is why churches shouldn't have money in it. And everything. This was the temple, not the church. And it was not the money that Jesus was upset that he despised. The love of money is the root of all evil, not money. Now, money is the source of all meals and it is important. It's what was taking place with the money that Jesus was upset about. And that is the third thing I want you to remember. Jesus was infuriated at people being hurt. Jesus was infuriated at people being hurt. What's taking place here is the people would come for Passover from all different other countries. And instead of bringing their own sheep or doves, and they would buy them there. It, was just, it just makes more sense. But the money changers were set up because they would come from different countries and regions. They had different money. And so they would change their money and then give them their new money for the local area. They were kind of held captive and they were cheating the people. They weren't giving them a fair rate and they were taking advantage of the situation of what it was like. It's like if you left Michigan and drove to Ohio and you tried to buy something and they said, oh, no, no, you can only use Ohio money here. You're going to have to exchange it, but we're only going to give you 50% of your money's value. Well, one of the lessons there is just don't go to Ohio, but Jesus is defending the innocence here. That's a big part of Jesus's ministry. You go from the woman caught in adultery to children to these travelers right here, people being preyed upon really upset Jesus. And I'd like to take a small time out in, in Luke 21 verses one through four, there's an event that takes place. I think people misread this event. Jesus is sitting there, it's a similar time as Matthew 21. He's sitting in the temple watching people put their money in as an offering. And this little widow comes along and she puts in two mites, it's all that she had. And everyone thinks when Jesus said she gave everything she had more than what you have, everyone assumes that Jesus is really applauding this poor widow. I don't think she, he's condemning the poor widow at all, but I do think he's condemning those who would take all the money that a poor widow could possibly have. See, the theme of that story in Luke 21 wasn't that Jesus was proud of the widow. He was condemning the religious people for taking it. If money is your God, get rid of it. But your God doesn't want your money. He wants you. The Bible speaks very badly about rich people, though. Look at the book of James. If God has blessed you, do something with the money that God has given you to advance the cause of Christ, to help other people. And if you're thinking, I want your money in our church, then do this. Help somebody out in your neighborhood and and, and do something for someone who could use a little assistance and do that for the glory of God. We don't want your money, but I want you to be close to God and I want God to use you. Jesus is not impressed with money or the people that have it. Look at verse 14. Who does he really want? And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Jesus repeats this about these people. He uses it as a story for salvation and who we're supposed to reach in Luke 14, 21. He says this, so that the servant came and showed his master, Lord, these things. The master of the house being angry said to the servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring hither the poor and the maimed, the halt and the blind. The religious people have an angry reaction to this. In verse 15, Jesus heals these people and they get upset at it. You need to ask yourself some of the things you're getting upset at, if they're really things Jesus would get upset at, or if you're getting upset at the things Jesus is doing. In verse 15, and when the chief priest and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, the wonderful things, and the children crying in the temple, what were they crying? They were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. And underline this part, they were sore displeased. That word sore displeased is just one word in the original Greek language. It means to be indignant. It means to moved with indignation. It means to be very displeased. It actually comes from a Greek word that means to bend your arms. It is the picture of someone holding their arms, literally crossing their arms because they are so disgusted at what they are seeing. This phrase would be used by the, G by the Pharisees to describe Jesus a lot. In Luke 13, 14, the rule of the synagogue answered indignation, excuse me, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. 
Jesus used it one time when describing about children being hurt in Mark chapter 10, verse 14. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. It's the same word and said, suffer the little children to come to me and forbid them not for such is the kingdom of God. But what earned the scorn of the chief priests to cross their arms in disgust? What were they so upset about? Kids singing. It is Hosanna, they said. Hosanna to the son of David. You see, Hosanna is a little different than hallelujah. Hallelujah expresses praise to the Lord and hope of salvation. But Hosanna is basically a plea for God to save us. Who are these children? Well, we don't know specifically, but most believe that these are 12-year-old boys. Remember, just like Jesus when he was 12 years old, who would go to the temple for their first time to celebrate their first Passover. The Pharisees are upset that these young boys who are there for the first time to worship God and be part of the Passover at the age of 12 are now singing, Hosanna, save us, Jesus, save us, Jesus. I'd like to point something out. It's not my intention to be political. But you know, the same people who want to put drag queens into public schools would not stand for me to go into the public school in Pontiac that we volunteer in and to take out my Bible and to teach them about Jesus. They would be so upset that I would have the audacity as a pastor, as a, as a preacher, to teach kids about Jesus. They would picket, protest, demand action, demand the government step in, the ACLU or anybody else. These same people will cheer on and be glad that men dressed like as women will go to read to children. If you're taking notes, there's three words I'd like you to remember, this phrase. Truth creates anger. Truth creates anger. These children are singing the truth. Hosanna, save us, because only Jesus can save us. Only Jesus can save us from the wrath to come. Yes, only Jesus can save us from the insanity that's going on in our nation. But this is not a political pulpit. This is a pulpit to talk to you about your soul and about your spiritual condition. It is Hosanna. Only Jesus can save you. So what does Jesus do in verse 16? He quotes the Bible back to them. And he said unto them, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, Ye have never read out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. He's quoting Psalms 8, verse 2. Psalm 8, 2. And the interesting thing about Psalm 8, 2 is that this verse is about praise to God. By quoting this and sort of defending himself, we'll say, Jesus is really equating himself and associating himself as being God. The Bible doesn't say it, but I think this probably made the Pharisees even matter. Not only is this one who's probably going to take away money from our little religious scam coming to town, these young zealot boys are now saying he is the Savior, and now he's calling himself to be God. But these are the words of Jesus. <clears throat> Verse 13, it is written, my house should be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. In verse 14, this is what his actions. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. In verse 16, we see more of his words. Have you never read, out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected faith? praise? And after that little truth bomb, like so often Jesus does, he's gone. Jesus has a pattern in his earthly ministry of teaching something, doing something, and then just slipping away. In verse 17, And he left them and went out of the city into Bethlehem, and he lodged there. But Jesus left us with a call to action in his words and in his deeds. So as we close today, I want to give you three things about a call to action if you're taking notes. The call to action that Jesus left us. Number one, the action for children. The action for children. I want to give you three things about that action for children. They all start with the letter P. First, we need to protect them. We need to protect them. We need to draw a line at protecting kids. We need to say, no further, you will not do this. See, we're not supposed to be cultural warriors. We're supposed to be warriors for Jesus. 
But every now and then, there comes a time and a place when as a believer in Jesus Christ, we have to stand up and say, this can't happen. This isn't wrong because of any particular religious reason. This is wrong because this is a wrong thing to do. And giving puberty blockers to children, drugs that are the same drugs that they give to chemically castrate sex offenders that will forever change their bodies, allowing young children who have not let come to the age where they can vote to have parts of their bodies removed forever, forever changing them. They're not old enough to get a tattoos, but they're old enough to mutilate their bodies. They will be sterile and they will have effects done to them for the rest of their life that they will never be able to unchange. We need to protect kids and stand up and say, this can't happen. We draw a line at protecting children. Secondly, we take the praise from them. We take praise from them. You know, kids say the truth. They have no filter. If a child tells you you're overweight, I got news for you, you're probably overweight. In Matthew 21, they declare the truth that Jesus is Lord and he is the only one that can save us. And thirdly, the passion for them. We need to have a passion for them. A church without kids is a church that is in danger and has to look themselves in the eye and ask why they have no children. We protect kids from the world and we do a, a best that we can and we try to create a safe place in the world for them. But we cannot let predators, those that are accused as being a child molesters, near them inside the church. We can stand up against Satan and we can say this is wrong and has to be done, has to be stopped. We can write our congressmen, we can go to school board meetings and say this has to be changed but we look the other way at a deacon because he smiles at us in church. We need to protect kids in the world, but we also need to protect them in the church. We need to teach them to praise, and we need to have a passion that's greater than the idea that we might offend somebody who gives a lot to our church. Secondly, the action that Jesus is talking about is the action to provide. The action to provide. In cleansing the temple, Jesus was protecting hurting people. He was protecting people who didn't have a choice and were being taken advantage of. We are supposed to be guardians as believers in Jesus Christ for the weak, for those that are being hurt. I love Batman. I'd be honest with you, I can't stand Superman. And I can't stand Superman because he always seems to cheat. If, if you know anything about comic books, you know the original Superman couldn't fly. He just jumped one-eighth of a mile, and then when he needed to fly, he flew, and then he had x-ray vision and eyes that shoot beams. I love Batman because he's just a normal person who has no physical different abilities than anybody else. He's not magic. He's not a superhero in that regards. But he protects the innocent who are being abused. He looks out for the little old lady who's being robbed, and he stops those that are being hurt by bad guys. That's why I love Batman. You see, this is reason is important. Why do we do what we do? The reason why we are guardians is important. We don't do it because of guilt. We don't do it out of political reasons. We don't do it because out of do-gooderism. The Rotary Club that we've helped and volunteered with that gives out shoes to the Clarks, they do a great job and they're a great charity. But we don't do things because of the same reasons they do things. We do things and we protect and we are involved in our community because Jesus saved us. Jesus changed us. He is the center focus and the reason why. And we want to reach everyone we can for him. So we provide and we help others. We are Batman. We are a guardian for others because Jesus provided for us. Number three, the action to please God. The action to please God. Why do you do what you do? See, the why is so important. We don't do it because we're afraid of God. We don't do it out of fear. We don't fear that God will judge us if we don't give, if we do the wrong thing, if we don't do the right thing. God is going to uh, send us a plague or flatten our tire or something bad will happen if I don't do this. We don't do it for that reason. We do what we do simply to please God. You see, one day, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I hope you get to hear these words. I want to hear the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. Enter into thy rest. I want to hear that one day. 
but today I serve him because I just want to worship him today by the things I do. In the year two, in 2016, a 26-year-old man from the UK by the name of Ben Ines was on an Egyptian air flight to Cairo. That flight, though, was hijacked by a man who appeared to have bombs strapped to his chest. He had the plane land in Cyprus. 52 of the 55 passengers were released, but three were left behind and then the flight crew. The seven Of the seven remaining, one of them was Ben Ines. He did something unusual. He was there on the plane and he walked up to the terrorist bomber and he said, hey, can I take a selfie with you? And he did. He took a photo and it's one of the most unusual photos because Ben is just standing there smiling and happy and the terrorist is looking at the camera confused, not knowing what to do, but he went along with it. Well, it turns out the bomb was a, a fake and he was eventually released. When he got released, he was asked why he took the photo, the selfie with the confused terrorist in the first place. Ben explained that he was attempting to just remain optimistic. He reasoned that if the bomb turned out to be real, he felt he really had nothing to lose anyway. May I say to you as a believer in Jesus Christ, what do we have to lose if we don't take action for Christ? Can they do something worse to us than take our lives? Because absent from this body is present with the Lord. It was in jail that Paul and Cyrus sang some of the sweetest songs of praise possible. What do we have to lose if we know Jesus, if we stand out and take the Word of God to the, this lost and dying world? What do we have to lose if we stand up for kids? What do we have to lose if we praise Jesus even though we are struggling personally? What do we have to lose, like that gentleman said? One of my all-time favorite stories and one of my favorite men in history is Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Just a school teacher from Maine, he was in charge of the 20th Maine group that found themselves on a July 3rd, 1863 on a hill in a, outside a town called Gettysburg. Defending that little hill called Little Round Top, he was fighting back the, the 15th Alabama Regiment. Wave after wave, day, va day after day they came. They had to keep the little round top. It was on the far left end of the Union's lines. And if the South had gotten it, they would have been able to shoot cannons right down on the northern line, breaking major holes. And they probably would have won the Battle of Gettysburg and probably eventually would have had the North just sue for peace. But then on the last day, Joshua Chamber Lawrence, one of his men, came up to him and said, we're out of ammunition. They knew that the 15th Alabama would charge that hill again. And with no other options, he told the men, fix bayonets. Put your bayonet on the end of your musket and we're going to charge. No longer are we going to sit here and let them come at us and wait and see what they have. We're going to charge the enemy. And with that, he executed what it's called a swinging gate, meaning men on the end of his line would run a little bit faster down that hill and men closer to the center would stay close and they would swing. And when the 15th of Alabama charged that little round top hill, they were not prepared for what came at them. Instead of a defensive Union front, they have autom automatically were faced with a charging force. And not a charging force coming at them, they were shocked to see Union soldiers come out of their right flank. And what took place is really a, an act of God. Confederate soldiers who were armed laid down their weapons to unarmed Union soldiers. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain saved the battle, saved the war, and ultimately saved us as a nation. You see, I think it's time for believers in Jesus Christ to quit being defensive, quit apologizing for the Word of God, quit being a, a scared to be a Christian publicly and out there. It's time to fix bayonets and get to work and charge with the Word of God, charge by loving kids, charge by saying, this is enough, this isn't going to happen. You'll have to get to these kids, you'll have to go through me. It's time to give the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Because what the world needs now is not more political debate and discussion. What the world needs now is Jesus as their personal Savior. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today at Cross Creek Online as we will now be from now on. I appreciate everyone who was with us last Sunday as we had our final in-person meeting and those of you that couldn't be there but were with us in spirit. 
Thank you for your support. Thank you for being an encouragement to me and to Cross Creek. Our foundation will continue throughout the school year as we go to a Pontiac public school, an inner city school, and we read with children and we provide snacks and resources for them. So if you'd like to be part of it, there'll be a link on our Facebook page if you'd like to join in and be part of that. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.